y'all. Good morning. God bless you. Thank you for joining us as we continue in our sermon series on rituals. As we look into the aspects of our Christian walk, our Christian faith, our Christian practice, and it's a good idea to put a little bit more Christian into those things, right? I mean, if we're going to do it, let's do it right. And so now we are going to talk about something near and dear to my heart, because I'm a Baptist, after all. We're going to talk about baptism. And I figured if we're going to put that word on our signs, we better know what we're talking about. Amen? So baptism is a long-standing tradition that we find in the Gospels, we find in the New Testament. It's been carried over in Christian walk for centuries as a consequence of it. But after a while of doing it a, a certain way, um, many people decided to re-examine, as we are re-examined, and make sure that we are doing it right. And lo and behold, they discovered that we were not doing it right, nor were we doing it for the right reasons or the right way. And we needed to rediscover what that was. That led to the formation of the Baptist denomination as a consequence of that. And many of the Protestant faiths, even as they stepped away, needed to step a little bit further in examining it, how baptism was conducted in the text, and maybe we should do it that way. And who it was for, and maybe we should do it for them, and why they were doing it, and maybe we should do it for those reasons. For instance, as they discovered, as they uh, studied baptism, what you'll discover is that nowhere in the text will you find a pedobaptism, which is the baptism of an infant, even though that was the practice of the time. Every single time that a baptism shows up, it was a believer's baptism. It was a baptism of someone who had accepted Christ as their Savior, and then as a conscious, soul, uh, sorry, a conscious decision, decided then to be immersed into the water. Which brings us to the next thing, is that also as we examine the way and the form in which baptism took place within the text, within the Bible, it was always an immersion, because they would go to rivers or lakes or what have you, and it's, it's really hard to tinkle a river on someone, right? They would immerse fully into the waters and arise fully into the waters, and truth be told, that's the way that Jesus did it, and last time I checked, if Jesus did something, maybe we ought to be doing it, right? And if Jesus did it a certain way, maybe we would just say, well, maybe let's not do that. Let's do this a different way, right? That doesn't really work out too well, does it? So let's do it the way that Jesus did. So if we're going to do it the way Jesus did, we got to examine the way Jesus did. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 3. That's the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3, first book of the New Testament. And while you're turning there, I'll tell you a story that I absolutely love. This is bonus material. It's not going to be on the test. I just enjoy it. So one of the origins of the Baptist denomination comes from a gentleman named John Smith, John Smith, however you want to pronounce it, who in 1609, he was coming out of the Church of England, he was examining the text, he was looking at some Anabaptist traditions, and he was falling into line with their thinking. See, Anabaptist was the, the label that was applied to them, because Anabaptist literally means rebaptizing. Because up until that point, everyone coming out of Catholic tradition or even high church Protestant tradition, they were baptized as an infant. But studying the word, disagreeing with that method, choosing instead to go for believer's baptism, they were accused of saying, well, that baptism didn't count. They want to get baptized again, right? So they were rebaptizers, Anabaptists. And from the Anabaptist tradition, John Smith and Thomas Helwes, who was his second in command there, they kind of studied things and they said they wanted to pursue that too, right? But they were trying to figure out how to do it, because once they discovered that their baptism didn't work, it didn't count, it wasn't for the right reasons, they wanted to get it right, so they had to figure out how to do it. But as they are trying to figure out how to do it, they were in a bit of a quandary, because no one else was trying to figure out how to do it quite right, and so how are they going to get baptized? And so John Smith says, you know what, I got this. I'm going to baptize myself. And he actually baptizes himself. Then he baptizes Thomas Helwes right after that, and then Thomas Helwes baptizes John Smith. And he figures at some point throughout all that mess, we're covered. All right? We've been baptized by someone who was baptized by a believer, and now I'm going to baptize you. And that is the start of our entire denomination. If you ever wonder in a business meeting why things go a certain way, it's because we've got our foot off on this particular start with self-baptizing, re-baptizing, and we'll get it there eventually. We'll figure it out. All right? And just trust in the Lord to give us the grace to cover over what we need. Amen? So let's look over into the baptism of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we'll begin with. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths you see, 
John was already presaged to be a presager. The prophet Isaiah said someone is coming who is going to let you know that the one who we need is coming. So here comes John the Baptist, whose job, whose role is to be a herald for his cousin Jesus. To let the world know that the word is coming. It is his job to get everybody ready. It is his job to get people to turn their hearts towards God. That's what repent means. To turn your heart from sin to God and get them ready to receive Messiah when he arrives. Because when Jesus Christ comes, God the Father only gave him three years to fix the world. Three years to get our stiff-necked, stubborn hearts of stone to turn around. To unlearn everything we thought we knew, right? That kind of sounds familiar to the way that we're approaching this sermon series, right? To unlearn what we thought we knew, right? So we can hear from God what is right. And before he hits there, so that he can hit the ground running, he is given the gift of the prophet John the Baptist to go forward and to get people ready. And John, who is called the Baptist, that is not his last name, is called the Baptist because he is baptizing people. He's getting them in the Jordan River to get them ready so that they can understand the importance of repentance and be prepared so that Jesus can hit the ground running. So let's look now at Matthew 3, verses 4 through 6. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. When Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Beloved, John the Baptist was really weird. Really weird. First of all, he had a garment made of camel hair. Now, hides just straight up here. I'm imagining how itchy that must have been. All right? And here he's now going out from the wilderness. Only where people go out in the wilderness. Every single time. You know why? You know who goes out in the wilderness? People who want to listen to God. All right? We were called to be peculiar people. I love that phrase. You can find it in 1 Peter 2, 9, the King James Version. To be peculiar people. Peculiar, to be set apart. That's what sanctified means. But peculiar means God deliberately wants you to be weird. He doesn't want you to be normal. He doesn't want you to be holding up status quo. He wants you to be different from the beaten path. Because last I checked, the beaten path leads to destruction. And he wants you to take a different route. Right? He doesn't want us to be just like everybody else. Because if we're just like everybody else, what's the point of following Jesus? If you read in the Gospels, and I highly recommend you do, Jesus doesn't follow everybody else. No, Jesus says, what you think is right is actually wrong, and let me tell you why. Come follow me. So we need to take that narrow path, that neither to the right nor to the left, but straight path to God. And that path is a path of weirdness. Embrace it. Just, just cuddle up and be grabbing all over how weird you get to be in Jesus. He wants you to be strange. Now, that doesn't mean we have to eat grasshoppers and honey. I haven't tried the combination. John the Baptist recommends it. But we do need to be different from our neighbors who don't believe. We need to be different from our co-workers who don't have Jesus Christ in their heart. We need to be different so that when people discover that they are missing something and there's an absence in their life, they can look for someone who's not like them and see the joy of Christ written in their heart. See that you bear the peace that passes understanding when things don't seem peaceful. Didn't we just have a prayer about how in the lion's den, that's where we discover peace, because that's where we discover God. And it's in those moments when we carry the peace of God that when we stand out as peculiar, as weird, there are moments when that weirdness will be calling deep to their deep. And they got to know how to find it. And they're not going to find it with someone just like them. Because just like them isn't the solution. So we need to have a little bit less of the world and stop trying to figure out how we can have a little bit of Jesus into our worldly, normal American living and figure out how we can have Jesus first and then whatever room the Lord allots for our normal society to fit into that and do it in reverse. We have to be peculiar. We have to be set apart. We have to be weird. Because everybody went to the wilderness to go see weird John because they wanted to get wet in order to repent of their sin. And get ready to hear about the coming of the Messiah. Amen? Amen. 
All right, so we're clear on that. Weirdos. All right, now, moving on. Matthew 3, 7. This is referring to John. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? That's not very invitational, John. That's not super politically correct. You don't get people to sit in the pews, John, if you're calling them a brood of vipers. People don't respond too well to that. Right. Interestingly enough, John, unafraid to be peculiar, is unafraid to be honest. And maybe honesty is a part of that peculiarity. And John, unafraid to be weird and different, is also unafraid of, as the kids say today, keeping it real. And telling people hard truths that they don't want to hear, but praise God they need. Because what is his role? What is his mission? To get people to repent. And so he calls them out on what they're doing. Because I guarantee you those Pharisees and those Sadducees did not come to get baptized. They came to take notes about who was getting baptized. Because to be baptized from John the Baptist as he's getting in the water is what? For repentance of your sin. So everyone who was getting his wet was declaring to everyone seeing them get wet, I'm a sinner. By the way. I've made mistakes, by the way. I've done wrong things, by the way. And I'm being bold enough to declare that, knowing that some of you will hold that against me. But be that as it may, I'd rather be weird so that the Lord can hold this not against me, but hold me to him. Amen. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were always so ready and quick to point out how great and righteous they were and how much better they were than others, were probably there for the wrong reasons, probably not there to get wet because... Obviously, I can't be a sinner. I'm a Pharisee. Obviously, I can't be a sinner. I'm wearing white robes. Obviously, as a teacher, I must be doing everything right, and I have no humbleness, but I have a whole lot of judgment. That sounds a lot more like the modern church that God doesn't want his church to be. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be weird. Because you know what's weird in this world today? Admitting when you're wrong. When's the last time you saw people do that? When was the last time you had a conversation with someone on the internet and in the midst of it they said, you know what, you made a good point. You know, I was wrong. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to agree with you right now. That's peculiar. But that's an honest and humble search for the truth, whatever the truth may be. Because we need truth. We need Jesus. We need humbleness and we need fear of the Lord. And those are two things that are absolutely missing from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Who came there to strut and to show off. And maybe receive a little secondhand glory. Maybe imply that they're approving of John the Baptist so they get credit for what he's doing. For whatever reason, John the Baptist has the hooks for to go up to them, the peculiarity, the weirdness, to go up to those in power, those everyone assumed was right because they were wearing red robes, because they were teachers in authority, because they were the people in power and position, and you assume that they're righteous, and he had the capacity to look them in the eye and call them what they were, a brood of vipers, Snakes in the grass. Who are not full of the Spirit of God, but full of venom. So he calls them out. Now that's not going to get a lot of people to join a church, but if the whole point is to bring you to God and we're not bringing you to God, what's the point of the church? Amen. So from time to time, I might let slip an offensive thing, something that isn't politically correct, something that's not warm and fuzzy, something that doesn't make you feel it's all about you because I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Whether we want to hear it or not, and we ought to want to hear it, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Because, beloved, that's all we need to hear. Matthew 3, verses 8 through 10. Still talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, John the Baptist says, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There you go again, John. There you go again. He says the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Axe is coming. Are you a good tree or not? Jesus tells us good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. 
Good trees don't produce bad fruit. Bad trees don't produce good fruit. You can tell the tree by the fruit producing. Amen? So bear fruit. How are we making this hard? He says right at the beginning, before he gets to that, bear fruit. Right? In verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And here we go again, John, not being very invitational, not being very politically correct. He's going to tell you something that you don't want to hear, and I'm going to repeat it in modern terms for us to be able to absorb. We have on our sign up there, visitors welcome, and, and boy, how do we believe it. We want you to come. We want you to come. We're going to make you feel welcome. We're going to give you a grip and a grin. We might even hug you. You never know what's going to happen. All right? And we say it on our placards, on our, on our website, it says, come as you are, and we sincerely believe that. All right? Yes, I'm wearing a suit, but I am the only one doing it. I basically do this so it's easy for when something goes wrong for you know who to blame, right? But come as you are. But here's where the John the Baptist uh, litmus test comes into the church. Come as you are does not mean stay as you are. I think I need to repeat that again in case there was a blip on the recording, in case you were listening to something else and your mind wandered for a second. Come as you are does not mean stay as you are. Amen. We have a lot of churches that have emerged in the sense where they want to emphasize come as you are so much that they don't want to offend anyone with the possibility of transformation, with the possibility of discipleship, with the possibility of growing in Christ. So you just comfortably be your worldly self and don't think you have to change anything about you because I don't want to judge you, I don't want to offend you, so I don't want to get rid of your ties, right? So I want you to stay here so you just be who you are. Beloved, the fundamental truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is we come to Jesus so that we can change. The only reason why we're coming to Jesus is because this part of my life I recognize was full of sin, mistakes, misery, and selfishness, and I don't want to be that anymore. I want to be who I was made to be. I want to be who I get to be, who glorifies my creator. I want to change. I want to grow. I want every day to read my word, pray to my Father in heaven, and be changed, be sanctified just a bit more, be perfected just a bit more. I recognize I am imperfect, but I am on a path to perfection, and that path is called Jesus Christ. So why would I want to stay where I am when I get to go and grow and become? We need to stop staying as we are. And we need to accept that four-letter word change. With open heart, embrace the invitation of Jesus Christ to make us better people. To make us more peculiar people. To transform us from that brood of vipers we once were. And I hope that was in the past tense. Be lamb. We've got to be lambs if we're going to follow the shepherd, you know? So let's be changed. They say a leopard can't change its spots. Can if Jesus wants him to change. They say once an addict, always an addict. Unless you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you behold, you are a new creation. They say that if you did something wrong and you tweeted about it, if you texted about it, if it was on the record 30 years ago, we'll ruin you now. God says, you're mine. I know what you were before. That's why I claimed you. Why I cleanse you. Why I give you a hope and a future. So, why do we want to stay in what the world thinks of us? When we already know the world is broken. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care where you spend your money. I don't care what you do. Watch. One thing we can all agree on as Americans world is broken. So instead of going to more people who cause the problem to fix the problem, good luck with that. Let's go to God as the only one with the capacity and the perspicacity to fix this world. And you know what? It starts with each and every one of our lives. So let's change. Come as you are does not mean stay as you are. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you have repented of your sin, Prove it. Show it. Live it. Be. Bear fruit in keeping with your repentance. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, live a life 
that demonstrates without you saying a word that Jesus Christ is your Savior. And oh, by the way, then say the word. <laughs> you see, Romans 6, 4 makes it very clear for us. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul says, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It needs to be that serious. That you die to your old self. That who you once were, who you were in the world, is dead. It's no more. So that you can live a new life. Beloved, if we are carrying the same bricks, we're just going to build the same house. And if we are moving from a situation that was rough and bad and we didn't like it, and so we want to go somewhere new, well, if we carry those same problems and that same mentality into the new place, we're just going to take that new place and turn it into the old place. Change. We need to let the old die. We need to embrace the new so that we can become the new. We must die to our sins, and that's what the baptism it represents. As we are dead with Christ and risen with Him into newness of life, that is the demarcation, the line of I am a changed person now. I've accepted Him, but I'm going to get serious about it, and now I'm going to live my life according to the way that God says I should live my life. And that's how you get that label of being one of those weirdos. One of those strange Christians. You can be Christian in the world as long as you don't talk about it. As long as you don't say anything about it, as long as you don't do anything with it, and they'll be okay with it, we'll just you know, like it, and then just let it go. As long as it doesn't in any way have any bearing on your life, because I don't want to have any bearing on mine. But if you're going to be one of those weird Christians, one of those people that actually talk to Jesus, one of those people that actually read their Bible, and then, here's the terrible part, they try to live their life according to the Word of God. You're going to be called one of those weirdos. Do you want to be peculiar people? You want to be strange for the sake of the kingdom of God. I hope you do. Because, beloved, if you don't, you're going to have a big problem. Because I'm going to let you in on a secret. You have to surrender everything to the Lord. Because what we don't surrender to God, we're going to have a problem. See, we're supposed to surrender all, all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength to the Lord. Most just won't cut it. Because the devil is persistent. He's got a lot of time on his hands. And he is singular, singularly focused on tripping us up, especially if we have the audacity to claim the name of Jesus Christ in our lives. He is singularly focused, and he will search for any and every chink in your armor. And guess where that chink in the armor is going to be? Whatever it is in your life that you haven't given over to God. And he will find it. And he will attack it like a freight train. Well, have you ever seen those commercials for antibacterial? You know, we're much more familiar with that stuff in the last three years. But antibacterial, what do they always say on the commercials? And it say on the labels, kills 99.9% of germs. That sounds really great, unless you've got a handful of 0.1% of germs, right? Then you might as well not have used the stuff, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? My soul is cleansed and protected from 99.9% of sin. Guess what's coming at you? What's going to come at you hard and fast and strong and relentless until you give that 0.1% over to God? Because all does not mean most. There is a breath of a difference between all and most in this conversation. There is a grand canyon between all and most in this conversation. And if you're going to give most to the Lord, get ready for... <coughs> Most of them might as well not have showed up. You have to give all. You surrender all. You have to be strange, peculiar, and stop living in the land of the 99.9%. .9 and let's be that strange 0.1% of Christians who take Jesus seriously. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Helps if you hold it up, right? So. Matthew 3, verses 11 through 12. John continues saying, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. There's more of that politically incorrect stuff. I mean, that doesn't sound like, what do you mean fire? What do you mean judgment? What do you mean parsing? If y'all aren't familiar with the way that they, they harvested their grain in, in these ancient times in the Middle East, what they would do is they would get all of their grain after they, they cut it down with their size, they went it around, and then they lay it down onto their, their threshing floor, because they're going to thresh it, right? And so then you would either get the, uh, the wheels, the heavy wheels, stone wheels to crush and grind everything up, or they'd get their oxen to tap dance a little mariachi all over everything and grind everything up. And then they would open the barn doors on both sides, one left and the right. And then they would wait for that evening wind to come through, that warm evening wind. And then they'd get that winnowing fork that they're talking about, and they'd scoop, and they'd just toss everything in the air, la di da -di everything. Well, guess what? The chaff is light, and so the wind will just blow that right out. But the grain, the good stuff, the stuff that you put all that time, sweat, and energy to get in the first place, the grain is heavy, and it will fall right down to the ground. So after a good evening's hard work of your winnowing fork, guess what? You now have a threshing floor full of good grain, and now outside of your barn you got all that chaff that you didn't want anything to do with. And so what do you do? You collect up that grain, you put it in your baskets, your barrels, and you have a good meal out of it as you make your good bread, your daily bread that you just harvested. And all that chaff out there that is good for absolutely nothing, Burn it up to clean your land because you don't want it around. It's just going to block the soil from being able to get the sun so the good stuff can grow there. So you just burn it up. And guess what? John is letting us know that's exactly what God is going to do. He is going to sift not just the world. He is going to sift his church. And that good grain, that useful grain, that nourishing grain, he is going to keep. It is going to stay within his barn, stay within his kingdom, stay within his kingdom. But the good for nothing is good for nothing. And it will be blown away to be burned. Because it's no value. The only value the chaff has is kidney. It's burning for fuel. Now, it may not sound politically correct, but it is the honest truth. And we need to be ready for that. We need to be ready to understand that the 0.1% stays in the barn and the 99.9 .9 that only gave God most that gets blown away. Do we want to be in the barn or out of the barn? Do we want to be the all or do we want to be the most? Do we want to be in the kingdom, disciples ready to obey our Lord and Savior or do we just want to check the block? Easter, Christmas, the occasional odd something. Do we want to be Christian? Christian. I say we be peculiar and we stand for God. And that, that's a cost. That requires sacrifice. That requires a new life and a new outlook on life. But beloved, that's why we're here. Because that's what we do. Whenever you talk about fire, I think of the refiner's fire. And I think that John is speaking of that a little bit here because he's, he's talking about how he baptizes with water for repentance, right? But the one who comes after him will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's talking about the refiner's fire, you see. You see, this isn't a, a baptism for, for, for belief, all right? That, that's already taken place. You're not in the conversation unless you've already believed him, unless you've already accepted him. The, the baptism by water is for repentance, by the way. Notice what he doesn't say it is. He doesn't say it's for salvation. <laughs> repentance isn't salvation. Salvation comes as a result of repentance. But the baptism for repentance, the purpose of repentance is for you to say to God, I was wrong. I made a mistake. I admit that what I did wasn't good and I want you. The purpose of repentance is to turn to God. Amen? And once we turn to God, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness and cleanse us of all our sins. Baptism isn't for salvation. You know, the baptism that is for salvation is the one that comes from Jesus Christ. The one that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fire. The baptism of the Holy Spirit that transforms you and claims you as the Holy Spirit places himself in your heart, makes you now his home, makes you now his temple. And that's where that set apart, that sanctification comes in. That's where that perfecting comes in. That's where that invitation for that walk as every day just a closer walk we lead, we get and we become more of the image of Christ and less of the image of the world. That's salvation. 
That's sanctification. That's justification. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And also, Jesus will baptize us by fire. The phrase baptism by fire comes from this. And we may have heard it. We usually refer to it as, as a rough first day. Yeah. Usually when someone says, you know, this isn't my first rodeo, there's a huge learning curve between that first rodeo and the second rodeo. By the second rodeo, you're expecting to know everything. It's not fair. Baptism by fire. You want to talk about baptism by fire? The 101st on D-Day. When their first combat jump is facing a significant amount of opposition from the German forces. That's a baptism by fire. Baptism by fire is now that your mind, get ready. Now that you have claimed Jesus Christ, get ready for the world to not be okay with that. Now that you've decided to be peculiar, ready to be treated as if you're peculiar. In a world that is accepting of everything and anything under the sun, the one thing that they don't accept is peculiar for Jesus Christ. I want you to pay careful attention to that. All the so-called toleration in this world that has now become the gospel of the world, the virtue of the world, I will dare you saying the God of this world, they are incredibly intolerant of those who claim Jesus Christ. Tolerant of every other religion under the sun, if they don't because the truth requires us to be peculiar. Be ready for that. Because she will be put in the refiner's fire. The refiner's fire is good. The refiner's fire is where we encounter God. The refiner's fire is rough. And deliberately so. It says in Psalm 66, 10 through 12, a beautiful poem about, about how the, the nation of Israel went through a refiner's fire. And Psalm 66, verses 10 through 12 says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. And you have brought us out of, to a place of abundance. Beloved, when a blacksmith gets to work, he selects for himself a hunk of metal. And on its own, the hunk of metal has a great deal of potential, but until you do something with potential, potential means nothing. So he selects a hunk of metal, and what does he do? First thing he does with it is he throws it into the fire. He throws it in the fire, and he keeps it in the fire. Because you know what? That metal can take a lot more than that metal thinks it can. Because that metal will just stay like that cool, that hard lump of rock. You know what? It'll get hot, it'll get warm, but you know what? It'll still stay that cool hump of rock until it gets really hot. Until it gets hotter than you think you can imagine. And then when it gets blazing hot, when it gets red hot, it then becomes malleable. And then, and only then, after the blacksmith has put it in the fire and has been working the bellows to stoke the flames, make them even hotter than you can imagine, only then does he pull it out of the fire, but he's not done with it when he pulls it out of the fire. Now that it's malleable, now that it's red hot, now he gets that big old hot hopper of a hammer, and he beats the tar out of that metal. He beats it and beats it and beats it and every blow has a purpose to shape that metal into what it's meant to be. To shape that metal until it is in the image that the blacksmith desires it to be. Beloved, everyone desires great character. And nobody wants to go through a character building situation. <laughs> But the only way you get character, unfortunately, is by building character. The only way you get character, unfortunately, is by God beating it into you. But look at the result, amen. After the blacksmith has done his good work, guess what? It is now shaped into a useful tool. A lump of metal does no one any good. But now that it has been shaped, it has a purpose, it has a role, and it can fulfill its task. And only then, after it's been beaten into the shape it needs to be, then, then, what does the blacksmith do? He takes this hot piece of metal, shaped as he desires it, and then he plunges it into the water. And it's quenched. And then he pulls it up out of the water, and it's no longer a hot tool, it is now a useful tool. Pulled out of the water, and once it is emerges from the submerging in the water, it is now a useful tool to be used by its maker. 
Beloved, if you're not paying attention, this is a, a metaphor for that. <laughs> when we emerge from the water, it's because we are now declaring to God, I am a useful tool for your purpose. I am ready to be used by my creator to do what he made me for. Amen. Praise God Almighty. The God of heaven is going to do something great. He wants to use me to do it. If you didn't get chills down your spine, you weren't listening to that. <coughs> The creator of the heavens and the earth, who made the stars also, by the way, just casually pointing out 99.9% .9 of the universe. He zooms right into you and you're like, you, who are you? Who am I? That my God would be mindful of me, let alone choose to use me. Lord, I am slow of speech, but Lord, I'm from the least of all clans, but Lord, pick somebody else. There's so many better people you can use. And God says, I'm aware, but I'm picking you. I want you. Because I don't just want this great thing to happen. He can make that great thing happen without anybody. What he wants is through that great thing happening, he wants you to draw near it. He wants you to have a hand in the kingdom of God. And beloved, if you work towards something, you value it more. If it's just given to you, if you get to show up and you don't have to contribute anything to it, you won't value it at all. You will abuse it. You will take it for granted. But if God uses you to help build his kingdom, how much will you cherish his kingdom that you get to be a part of? How much will you cherish that brother or sister who is sitting next to you in eternity and not in the fire outside of the barn who has heard and has become one of the 0.1% because you share the gospel of Jesus Christ? How much more will you love that person and cherish the eternity you will spend? No, but we get to be used by God, and that's what baptism is for. To be forged into a tool worthy of the hand of God. And now we're actually going to get to the part of the Bible that I said we were going to talk about. And that is the baptism of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Matthew 3, here we go. Verse 13 through 15. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him. You didn't hear that wrong. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he said. See, just before this, John was talking about his cousin. He said, there will be one who will come after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. Your text may say, I am not worthy to untie his sandals. And your text may say, I am not worthy to tie his sandals. Whichever way you go with the semantic range of deciphering that particular verse in the various Gospels that present it, John is saying, I don't get to touch your shoes. All right? And shoes were not a sign of glory in the ancient Near East. Quite the contrary. Shoes were seen as less than. If you really want to be politically incorrect next time you travel to the Mideast, just take off your shoe and show the bottom of the supply. See how that goes over. Right? So John the Baptist is saying, I'm unworthy to be even where his feet are. I am unworthy to be near his shoes. This one who is so much greater than I. I who baptized by water symbolically. He who baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire is coming. And he's coming to me now. And he's saying he wants to be baptized by water by me. Who am I? And he says, no, 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 Jesus. This isn't right. We're doing this back. I, I need to be baptized by you. John the Baptist is doing his best impression of John Smith trying to figure out this whole baptism thing and how he can get his to be official and sanctioned, right? Because John the Baptist has something that those Pharisees, those Sadducees lack. And I'm not talking about the money, because, yeah, he lacks that. I'm not talking about the fine white clothes, because I'm pretty sure camel hair ain't white. I'm talking about, however, humbleness. Humbleness and desire for truth. I, I, I don't deserve honor of baptizing. You don't even need to be baptized. What? You have no sins that you need to repent. Hebrews 4.15 makes it clear that though he was tempted in every way as we are, he was yet without sin. He has nothing to repent of. Jesus, why are you even here? Do you want to take over? But Jesus says, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And I ask you the question, why did Jesus come? Jesus came to die on the cross. 
He came to die on the cross to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, right? He came to make us, and why, why do we need to be cleansed of our sins? Right? And this is very politically correct. I have, I have unfortunate news to share with you all. We are perfect, and we have made mistakes, and we have deliberately done the wrong thing. We have sin in our life, and it needs to be cleansed. What is sin? Sin is disobedience to God. We have not been obeying God. We have not been treating God as God. But guess what? Jesus died for you. If you believe in him, you can be cleansed of that. You can be washed away from your sins. You can be removed from a state of disobedience. But guess what? You don't get to stay there. You have some life to live now. You see, salvation is not the end goal. It is the start of the journey. And now that you are here, now that you've been cleansed of your disobedience, we can't walk forward in disobedience because that's where we came from. Now we need a way to obey. See, the law was very clear. The law proved to us that we couldn't keep the law. The law showed to us that we are worthy of our condemnation because the law only condemned. No man could keep all of God's laws and statutes. No one could do it. And they were adding more stuff onto it. And they were definitely not even keeping that stuff either. So what do we do? We need a way to obey. So Jesus came not just to cleanse us of our sins, but to give us a means to obey. He fulfilled all of the law for us. He was so obedient, perfectly obedient to God the Father, that he was obedient to him on our behalf, so that now we don't live under the law, we live in grace, so we can try to obey him. And that required perfect obedience. Jesus, who knew no sin, was called by God the Father to fulfill all righteousness, so get baptized, Jesus. And Jesus didn't balk at that. Jesus didn't say, I don't need this. I don't have time for this. I only have three years to get the ground running, and this is how you want me to start? No, because Jesus is Jesus. And Jesus said to the Father, yes, Lord. And if Jesus says to the Father, yes, Lord, what do we say? Yes, Lord. I'm sorry, what was that? What do we say to God? Yes, Lord. Amen. So if Jesus was baptized, not because he needed it for salvation, but in order to obey the Father, if we want to obey the Father, do we need to be baptized? Do we need to follow suit in the example of Jesus Christ? Yes. Now, is it necessary for salvation? No, because the thief on the cross proves that. The thief on the cross who said, he admitted that he was a sinner, I deserve this. He believed in Jesus Christ, he said he was Lord, and he confessed that he was Lord before others and was mocked for it. And what did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. I'm pretty sure that they didn't get the little teacher thing and start hitting them with the water while he was up on the cross. Is it necessary for salvation? No. But is it necessary to follow the Lord by following the Lord? Yes. If we can, do. If we should, do. And at a certain point you may be saying, well, I don't need to be baptized, or, or I'm going to be embarrassed and up there and other people around, and I don't want to do it for that reason, or, or i got a thing with Jesus and we're fine and everything. There's a certain point where you need to understand that your desire to not follow Jesus more closely is a problem. <clears throat> and is demonstrative of your need to get in the wall. Because Jesus obeyed the Father completely in things that he didn't need to do, and in things we need to do, we certainly need to obey him. And we need to have a little bit more of that Jesus Christ in our hearts that simply says, yes, Lord. That simply realizes we get to say, yes, Lord. But God is calling. So let's answer. Beloved, if you've been paying attention to what we've been talking about with baptism, the Baptist understanding of baptism is that this is a statement, a declaration of faith and trust and obedience. And that's why it's powerful. Some other denominations say that's when grace is conferred upon you. It doesn't have to be there for you to be able to receive it. And that's going to be problematic for those who are incapable, physically incapable of getting submerged in the water. Or physically incapable or simply don't have the time like the thief on the cross. And God isn't so legalistic to require these things. And for people to say, well, it's a part of just being entered into the culture of it. Jesus isn't interested in culture. He's interested in real relationship. He's not interested in ritual for the sake of ritual. He gives you ritual so that by that ritual, you can understand him better. It has to have a purpose and a reason, and the reason is the same that Jesus has had, to declare, I am obedient. I said before him, when people were getting the water, they were publicly declaring that they were sinners, that they were in need of salvation, they were in need of that Messiah who was to come. The reason why we get into that water is to declare to everyone, I need Jesus. 
And praise God Almighty, I have Jesus. See, between here and there, that baptism by the Spirit and that baptism by the fire makes you a believer, allows you to be able to say, Jesus is my Savior, and too many Christians stop right there. But when you're ready to graduate from milk to meat, when you're ready to graduate from just being into doing, when you're ready to grasp that D of discipleship, that's when it's time to get into the deep water and say, Lord, you are my Savior. Yes, but I, I understand better now the reason why you're Savior, the only reason why you're my Savior is so that now me who is a traitor, me who deserves death, now I have the capacity to say Jesus is my Lord. And the 99.9% live their life like Jesus isn't their Lord. The 0.1%. The 0.1% that can't get enough of Jesus Christ. We want Him to be our Lord. We are overjoyed that we get to call Him our Lord. We get to surrender to His will and His way. He is going to lead, guide, and direct us perfectly so long as we walk where he tells us to walk and go where he tells us to go. You ought to want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's many who believed in him, and they wanted to be a disciple. So he told them, okay, go. Sell your goods to the poor, then you follow me. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. Or they say, well, I just want to bury my dead father first. No, no, come down. <laughs> There's many who are given the opportunity to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and they turn away because of this in their past, because of the bricks in their sack that they wanted to carry with them, and Jesus said, because of whatever excuse earned in the Son they have. Maybe we need to stop trying to come up with excuses as to why I shouldn't be a disciple. Just surrender to God and the joy that I give to be a disciple. And it requires trust. That's the whole point of discipleship. 1988 Olympics, they showed, Winter Olympics, they showed this special where they are teaching blind people how to ski. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with skiing, but I, that's kind of tricky if you can see. But what they did is they would pair them with a sided seer. It's not the blind leading the blind, as Jesus was talking about, but with a sided seer. And as they were going down the slalom, the person would simply say, right. And then the blind person would go right. Left. And the blind person would go left. And they would navigate the course. Because they moved when they were called to move. Obedience, by the way, is not when I get around to it. Obedience is I will do what is asked of me when it is asked of me. And I will do it not because I've assessed it myself and I've judged it and I figure out what I want. And, I'll, and then I'll agree with you that it's right. No, obedience is he said it, I'm going to do it. And this particular illustration delightfully informs us that it's a life or death scenario if we disagree. And it's always a life or death scenario. Beloved, if we are going down and we are with Jesus and we have our and we're blind and we can't see anything, and he says go right, that doesn't mean I'll go half right. Or I'll hesitate for a minute and then go right. Or if not, I'm going left. Or no, I'll just go straight. And then we crash, we trip, we fall, we get up, we're bruised, we're battered, we're broken, and then we blame him for doing it wrong. Because we didn't listen to do it right. So we get up again, and this time he's not saying anything. And we're like, oh, 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 no, no, no. There must be a right right now. I'll go now because we're not waiting for him to say right and go right. When he says right, we get froggy, and we jump ahead of him, and we go right, and we hit that tree, and we crash, and we burn, and we're broken, and we're battered, and we blame him for doing it wrong. When once again he was doing it right, we weren't trusting him. And if you're looking at this scenario, you know what? I guess I'd understand if I had a blindfold on and was going down the tracks, I could better understand this relationship that you've missed the point. Because, beloved, we don't need a blindfold. We are actually blind. It is not putting blinders on. We are blind. We cannot see the way forward. We cannot judge the way forward. We cannot know the way forward. But we can hear his voice and he knows the way. And when we recognize we have no capacity whatsoever, but can only survive by being obedient to the voice of Jesus Christ, then we cross the finish line. And how do we get to that level of trust? I get to the water. How do we get to that level of obedience? By coming out of the water and saying, I command all of you to be witnesses. And hold me in Discipleship, taking it seriously, and living that peculiar life where Jesus says, 
right and I go wrong. And when Jesus says nothing, I don't turn to the right or to the left. But I wait for his command and his call. No matter how afraid I am, I trust in the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, and I'm tired of giving my God 99.9. That's discipleship. That's perfect submission. What it's all about. Trusting the Lord and leaning not on our own understanding. That's the first step of discipleship. That's the first step we make out of the Lord. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This beautiful moment, this momentous occasion when all three persons of the Trinity are present as once. When you could see Jesus coming up out of the water. When you could see the Holy Spirit descending from heaven. When you could hear the voice of the Father. And what does the Father say? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. This is the one you need to follow. And then Jesus begins his ministry. I'm going to let you in on a little secret for me. When we do as Jesus does, we receive as Jesus did. When we go to the baptistry, when we come out, the heavens may not dramatically part. Birds may not come into the building. But beloved, if you listen, you will hear the voice of the Father say to you, this is my beloved Son. When is a father pleased with his son? When his son is obedient, trustworthy, and good. Yeah, he'll love them all the time. Any parent knows, even when they're being nutlaid, you have to love them. But we're pleased with them. We like them when they do what we say. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Who wouldn't want to hear that from the Father? Who wouldn't want to hear that from your maker, your God, your King, and say, I am pleased with you? So then we know what the path for that is. The path to the pleasing to be. When God says, do this, do this. When God says, don't do this. That's how we please the Father. The Father who loves us. Who loves us despite ourselves. Who wants what's best for us. Who takes the patient time to walk with us from the cross to the waters of baptism. Holding our hand that whole way while we baby step until we're ready to grow up as Christians. And go. And be soldiers in His army. Be tools for His glory. I want to graduate. I want to level up. Martial artists wear with pride their belt, and that belt determines what level they are. As you start off as a simple white belt, hey, I'm just happy to be here. I'm learning the moves. This is kind of cool, you know. But as you level up, as you progress, eventually, can you imagine the pride that comes when you tie on that black belt, which proclaims that I am a master, that I have gone through years of study and training and bruises and dedication and practice and practice and practice to get to where I am today. Listening to my master so they can instruct me right so I can be here today and stand before you. And I can't even remember what it was like when I first started, but here I am now. Well then, step in the water and get started on the real journey Christianity. Give me an excuse to fill up this baptistry. It has been dry too long. If you were baptized before but you did it for the wrong reasons or you didn't know why you did it, we will get you wet. If you haven't yet been baptized, we will get you wet. Give me a reason to fill that up. I even promise you we will sweep out the scorpions. <coughs> I'm pretty sure the Gospel of Mark says you're not supposed to worry about those anyway, but we will do it. I can't guarantee you that they won't go back in, but you'll be fine, right? Get in the water. And let's give this community right here, this family here, a reason to rejoice. 
Because coming out of that water is a peculiar person. Is a Christian that has given God 100% of their heart. Is someone who is saying, I am going to obey the Father in heaven. Isn't that the whole point? And beloved, if it hasn't been you already, it can be you. It can be you. All it takes is a desire, a commitment that we should already be making. Let's just make it public. And do the ritual right. And let the Father's declaration of Jesus Christ be a declaration to you. Because between here and there, there's a slight difference in a word. Contentment in my relationship with Jesus or contentment with my relationship with Jesus. What is glory? What is sin? I am content in my relationship with Jesus. No matter what I have, I have it because of the awesome grace of my God and the blessings he has. Because you know what? And I don't even need it. Because whatever I have, I have Jesus first and foremost. And Jesus is enough. Jesus is my all in all. And I am content in my Lord no matter where I am or wherever he leads me. And what he shapes me to be. And what I get to give to the kingdom. I am content that my Lord has called me. And then there's contentment with my relationship. That's good enough. I mean, I said the words, I said the prayer, I showed up at church every now and then, sometimes I put money in the plate when I feel like it, sometimes uh, they have a service project that sounds cool, I'll jump on board on that, but I'm, I'm good, I've got enough Jesus in my life. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? The word makes a big difference, in or away. Who do you want to be? Yes, I want to be with Jesus, but they have to the point where you grow and you understand being with Jesus is not enough. Beloved, we need to be in Jesus. That only comes from such. So, do we want to accept him not just as our Savior? Praise God Almighty, you accept him as your Savior. But are we ready to grow up in Christ and accept him as our Lord? Because we have, have, to accept him as our Lord if we're going to dwell in the kingdom. Because he's the king. If we're going to live in his house, we got to live by his rules. I know you said that to your kids. <laughs> we're going to live in his house. We have to accept him as our Lord because he is the Lord of the living. And shouldn't we want to be a citizen of that kingdom? So, beloved, here's my challenge to you. Get what? Be thirsty to be flooded in Christ. Be thirsty to be transformed into a new living thing, a transformed thing. And if you have already received your baptism, call back to that. And I want you to live your life like you're still dripping wet. I want you to live your life like you stepped out of the water, but you're bringing the water with you. That you haven't dried off. Because you know there comes times when you step out of the water and you come down and you've been dried and it was a wonderful transformation. You've been changed now symbolically from the dead to the living. That's the reason why we hold you under the water to the bubble stuff. <laughs> That's the devil leaving. No? No. Okay. But you're new. You're alive. And you've got that high and you're ready to run 100 miles per hour for the kingdom of God. But we don't run 100 miles per hour forever. We get tired. We get distracted. Things happen. Beloved, you don't have to get rebaptized three times like Don Smith. That kind of defeats the purpose of it at a certain point. But you can get reconsecrated in your heart. And you can pick those waters back up and be refreshed by the living water. And carry it with you. And walk dripping wet into this dry and arid wasteland. And bring the living water with you. Because you have been marked by the living God. You are His. So you're going to live your life according to the living Where's Peter? Or else, where are you going to go? I mean, you alone have the word of God. So let's stop being 99.9% and saying, good enough. Let's be disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's be challenged by God. And let's grow. <coughs> because only people that are challenged by God and rise to the occasion do great things. None of this mediocre stuff that post-modernity has, has thrust upon us. You want to walk on water? Then you've got to step out of the boat. You want to walk in the fire with Jesus Christ? 
then you've got to tell a king, whether he saves me or not, I'm not going to bow to your idol. If you want to do great things for the kingdom of God, then when you're challenged, say yes to go. Heavenly Father, you have called us. And we are listening. And we desire more of you. <coughs> You are our all in all, and as we discover that more, more we crave from you, and more we have from you. Stoke the billows, Lord. Stoke the billows. And pump, Lord, all that air into us. Pump, Lord, so that the fires are even hotter, Lord, so that we can be molded and shaped and used by you. Refine us, God, and burn away all that chaff that's in the way, that distracts Refine us, Lord, so that we can be your tool. And when we are ready, Lord, plunge us in the water so that we are quenched and ready to be used. Lord, stop letting us give you excuses for why we're not ready. And start giving us the ears to hear the reasons why we are. Send us forth, God. Load us up with honey and locusts. And send us forth, Lord, to be your tools. In the glorious name of Jesus Christ. The name by which I seek to be a disciple. We pray, Lord. Amen. I bless you all. 592.